Tracking the who, why, where of disease and contagion wasn't always a rock star type profession, but in the midst of a global pandemic, that's what it's become. The field of epidemiology and its practitioners, epidemiologists, almost overnight had to step up to a major role in this public health crisis, analyzing and explaining the spread of COVID-19 to a stunned public. A tall order that's ongoing and that brings to our airwaves tonight in the nation's capital, there's Ray Watt Dianandan, epidemiologist and associate professor at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Health Sciences. In the downtown core of our provincial capital, Susie Hota, medical director of infection prevention and control and an infectious disease specialist at the University Health Network. And in East York, Ashley Chute, infectious disease epidemiologist at the University of Toronto's Dalalana School of Public Health. And I'm so grateful to get the three of you away from your normal jobs uh, to do this extra job that you have now all discovered you have to do during the time of a global pandemic because, well, let's face it, I'm guessing that probably a year ago, 90% of Ontarians uh, never mind couldn't spell epidemiology. They didn't know what an epidemiologist did for a living, uh, but we sure do now. So let's get a better understand. Let's start there and get a better understanding of that. Susie, tell us what your days are like. What are your responsibilities? Well, my job really entails um, try to prevent healthcare associated infections, tracking infections, and in the context of a pandemic, really um, being prepared to respond to something like this, an emerging infectious disease um, that can affect both hospitalized patients as well as those out in the community. My days are very diverse. I have a lot of meetings in which we're doing planning and response, uh, going through response measures within the hospital. I play a role within the region to try and coordinate efforts within hospitals in responding to the pandemic. Uh, I review cases that come up within the hospital of COVID-19 and exposures, and a lot of time is spent on outbreak management, which now is Beyond just the hospital, we're also now helping long-term care homes that are in significant outbreaks of COVID-19. So it, it's really a range of things that happen day to day. Ashley, how do you see your mission? So, so I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist and a mathematical modeler. So before the pandemic, I was working on communicable diseases and how they spread. And when COVID came, I pivoted to work on COVID because you know that's sort of what I'm trained to do. But I do, you know, I'm a researcher. So most of what I do is around projections and, you know, trying to understand what's happening in the population, looking at the data that we have to try and understand the epidemic trajectory, to try and think about, you know, what sort of interventions should we have in place when and for how long. And, you know, as the pandemic has progressed, I've had roles in terms of, you know, serving on committees at both the um, provincial as well, as well as the federal level. Again, you know, thinking about the epidemiologic data and how we can use that to try and guide the response. And Raywat, how about you? Well, I'm a, I call myself a global health epidemiologist. So I look at a variety of data sources and fold in some political science and economics and history to answer questions about inequities in health around the world. I'm not an infectious disease model like Dr. Jude or a clinician like Dr. Hota. So I, my application of my skills is limited in this pandemic, but I think I'm a pretty good communicator and a pretty good teacher. So I've been focusing on accessing and articulating the science to people who do not have that expertise. That's my role in this uh, emergency, I think. And Ashley, does it go without saying that you are working more hours and you have more <laughs> intense responsibilities since last March 13th? Yeah, absolutely. I've been working on COVID since January and it's it's been a... <laughs> It's been a bit of a whirlwind because I am doing my my job and also, you know, talking to people. You know, there's this huge interest in terms of media. So that's sort of on top of the, the day job that I'm doing. I'm going to pick up on that a little more in just a bit. But uh, Susie Hoda, maybe you can pick up the story there. How much more intense, difficult, long are your days now compared to, say, a year ago? Oh, it's, it's a completely different world. Uh, I'd say, you know, on average, it's a 12 to 14 hour days of intense work now. You know, it's picking up on areas that I haven't been involved in before, uh, long-term care, uh, regional coordination, um, the media side of things and communications, which is really also important. Uh, and also no weekends. I mean, it just, it's been very intense. Okay, let's go to the media thing. Raywat, do I assume that, uh, let's say over the last nine months, 
you've been doing a lot more media interviews than you had, let's say, in the previous nine months. It's well over a thousand interviews now in the past nine months. And before that, maybe five or six in a year. And I'm on parental leave right now. So all this interrupts my diaper changing schedule. <laughs> right? So it's, it's a bit of chaos in my life. I'm trying to do the math on this. Literally, I mean, if you've done a thousand interviews over the last nine months, we're talking like three, four a day. Oh, easily. Uh, I get about 20 requests a day. I accept maybe six. And some days, it's, you know, I feel more active and I'll do more. Susie Hoda, your life the same? Uh, you know, during times when I could accommodate it, I would try to do two or three interviews a day. Now it's getting more and more difficult, so I do what I can. Um, but but definitely, it's uh, it's it's a lot more time commitment, um, but worth it. Ashley, how about you? Yeah, I would say similar. I mean, it waxes and wanes depending on what the the hot topic of the day is. But yeah, I mean, if I think I could. You know, if I had the time, you could spend your entire day and, you know, 12 hour days just doing the communication side of things. So it, it can be incredibly overwhelming and really hard to, you know, because we do have day jobs. So it can be hard to, to strike that balance well, between that's, wanting to communicate. Exactly. That's what I was going to ask, because don't don't get me wrong. We're thrilled that you're spending as much time with us mm -hmm. as you are. But uh, I must say, I also feel a little bit guilty taking you away from the work that you're sort of trained and really supposed to be doing. Uh, Ashley, how do you manage that balance? Um, sometimes better than others. Um, for me, you know, turning off my email and just sort of, you know, not checking it for a few hours is is my my way of getting some focus in and and trying to get work done. But again, you know, I think. I think it depends on what's going on. I think sometimes it's really, really important to be available and to have those conversations with people um, more so than other times. And so, you know, if it's, if it's a topic or an issue that is really important to me, I will make the time. But sometimes I definitely do need to sort of scale back and, and really focus on, on the work that I'm trying to accomplish. Now, for Ray Wett, I can understand this. He's, he's an associate professor at a university, and educating the public is obviously part of his mission. Uh, but Susie Hoda, I, you know, I would not have thought that public education was necessarily part of your mission when you first got your job at UHN. So how different is the job today compared to then? Well, yeah, it's always been a bit of an expectation that there would be some public ex you know, communication when you do the kind of work that I do. Uh, outbreaks occur. You have to be transparent about what happens uh, within those outbreaks. It affects the whole public as well. Hospitals are part of the public uh, and perform an important service to the public. So it is a bit of an expectation. This degree of uh, public communication, maybe not, but um, I think many of us feel that it's an important uh, thing that we're obligated to do and would like to do to try and help inform the public. Now, we know that politicians, when they do interviews, get media training. That's just part of the gig. And you folks are on TV and doing radio interviews and newspapering and so on far more than probably 95% of the politicians in this country right now. Maybe not the health minister, maybe not the premiers, um, but certainly, you know, way more than most average politicians. So I got to ask, Ray, what did, did the University of Ottawa take you aside at some point and say, you know what, if you're going to be on TV this much, let's get you some training? No. However, uh, we do have those facilities available to us. I just never took advantage of them. And I, the thing about being a professor is you lecture all the time. You're used to engaging with people with questions and trying to meet them at their level of understanding. So this should not be a big leap for people who engage in public education on a day-to-day -day basis to make to engage with media and the general population. Ashley, how about you? At any point, did Dalalana pull you aside and say, let's get you some training if you're going to be on TV this much? No, no. And, and I mean, to be perfectly honest, you know, before this year, I hadn't, I think I've spoken to a reporter once, you know, this is not a natural thing for me to do. And it certainly has been a learning curve. Because yeah, it's not, you know, I'm much more comfortable sort of sitting at a computer and crunching numbers, not really having conversations with people, particularly live conversations. That to me is, is, is something that still strikes a lot of fear in my heart. Well, what's the most unpleasant part about doing all these interviews? Um, I, I think the, the, the inability to correct yourself. You know, I think, you know, as a scientist, I like to be really precise and really clear. And, you know, you don't always get the message right. And that can be, that can be challenging. And sometimes you want to rewind and, and sort of have a do-over. Do and you can't always do that. Susie Hoda, any media training for you? 
I think when I started this job, I got a slide deck from our public affairs department <laughs> on communications, but really outside of that, no, no formal uh, training in this. So you three are just naturals. Well, that's good. It's good to be a natural. Nice to hear. All right. We do have to talk about the other side of this, though, because the reality is that when you take a prominent public role in public education, as you three have, uh, you are going to run into people who don't necessarily like the message that you are trying to convey. And Ray, why don't we start with you? Um, I don't know how much you are on social media or what your email inbox looks like after you do your TV hits, uh, but tell us about some of the, um, well, what are some of the less savory things you get told? Right, you get called a lot of names and sometimes they go for the lowest hanging fruit. For me, it's my skin color. For I'm sure my other colleagues here, it's their gender. And oftentimes people are lashing out out of pain and they don't, they're not looking for uh, reason discourse. They're looking to hurt you, looking for conflict. I, I tend not to engage. Having said that, the vast majority of feedback is positive. And so it's easy to focus on those handful of negative responses, but we really have to look at the, the entirety of the engagement and recognize that most Canadians are actually grateful for these, uh, these attempts. But to talk about the negative for a second, occasionally it does descend into you know, threats of violence. And that makes going outside sometimes a little scary because I do get recognized now and my spouse gets very nervous about uh, those incidents. Like, is it going to be a positive event or is it going to lead to something requiring a call to the police? It hasn't gotten that far yet. I'm sure some of my colleagues it has gotten pretty bad. Could you give us a ratio on, you know, positive to negative? It used to be about 50 to 1, but it's gone to about 100 to 1. I mean, the positive has really increased in the last little bit, which is really inspiring to see. Good. Susie Hoda, how about you? What are you getting on social media or in your emails? I think it's a lot of the same. It, there is the majority of, of what I get is positive. That's really reassuring and nice to see. Um, but I have had some unusual messages. I've had some threatening messages as well. And, um, you know, it's disconcerting. And it, it does make you kind of uh, second guess sometimes whether uh, what you're doing is right. Um, and usually I'm quickly able to kind of um, recognize that that's the minority of people who respond that way. And then there's also that sort of uh, more passive uh, or difficult to sort out bullying that can happen on social media. Um, and um, that that takes its toll because it's more subtle, but it's it eats away at you a little bit. So it's it's not always easy doing the media, but I try to remind myself that the majority of the comments are positive. I want to walk a tightrope here because on the one hand, I don't want to be overly sensationalistic about this. But on the other hand, I can imagine there are some people watching or listening saying, well, it's probably not that bad. So maybe let's be specific here. Can you tell us the kind of thing that you might receive that you would find disturbing? Um, well, I, I have received one uh, message that um, told me, uh, I wish you would burn. And, they, you know, comments like that, I, nothing that was a personal threat, but uh, certainly threatening sounding, a lot of name calling, things like that. Uh, those are the worst of the messages. A lot of the other messages are just, you know, people probably airing their frustrations at this point in the pandemic. Ashley, how about you? What's your experience? Um, I've had some unpleasant experiences, you know, most of it on social media in terms of, you know, people questioning your motives and this idea that, you know, we're, we're in positions of privilege and we, we're somehow benefiting from lockdowns, which, you know, is, you know, kind of absurd. But, you know, I think as Rewa said, a lot of this is coming from from people who are hurting and who are in pain, you know, there's, I think there's a bit of a dichotomy or they're, they're the actual trolls who are really just there to, to, to stir up dissent. But there are people who I've had, you know, emails from who, you know, if you, if you actually engage with them, it's because, you know, they're, they're in pain, they've suffered through this pandemic and they, they don't entirely understand what's going on. And so some, some of those conversations can actually be, be fruitful. But again, you know, it takes time to engage with people and it can be it can be challenging. And just so I'm clear, if you do engage with someone who, you know, never mind the haters or the trolls, but if you do engage with someone who seems to be lashing out uh, because they genuinely don't understand or they're, or they're, you know, feeling pain for whatever reason, if you engage with them, are you able to uh, sort of cut through and eventually get to a better place? Sometimes. Sometimes. I mean, sometimes you just need to leave it. But there certainly have been examples where, you know, I, I think you sort of 
explain, you know, that this is not, you know, there's, there's no good options during this pandemic and we're sort of doing the best that we can. And, you know, this, this is not a personal attack on, you know, trying to ruin someone's livelihood. Okay. Moving on. I want to read a quote here. Uh, this is, uh, this is from the Ottawa citizen last fall, the president of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Alejandro Adam, who said, as we think about what it means to build back better, one takeaway seems obvious. Let's leverage this mass science lesson to foster a broad-based culture of science literacy. If one legacy of COVID-19 is a nation where people feel better informed and more capable of grasping scientific issues, we'll be in a stronger position to thrive in the post-pandemic world. A scientifically literate society is better positioned to confront far-reaching problems from global warming to the next pandemic. Okay, let's pick up on that. Ray Watt, how much of our general scientific illiteracy as a society do you think um, is, at, you know, is at the root of a lot of what you have to encounter in your day? Oh, so much of it, absolutely. And the quote is correct. We have a window of opportunity here. We have to take advantage of it. When I first started writing about this pandemic, hoping to explain some of the science, I was stunned by how low the level of understanding was, but how uh, it's the lowest hanging uh, fruit, really, I'm grasping for, I'm explaining how, what a virus is, explaining what transmission and infection are. So I would like to see us reinvest in literacy across the board, not just science literacy, but all kinds of literacy. But in terms of science literacy, literacy, it's not even the complicated stuff that needs to be addressed. Understanding why we need a control group, understanding the levels of evidence, why a randomized controlled trial is better than expert opinion, understanding that scientists speak in equivocating terms, like I'm unsure of this and this needs more work, and that's better than someone on YouTube expressing certainty. So that level of understanding of the nature of science can really do a lot of good in helping the population navigate misinformation from true information. Uh, since you are an educator, I should ask you this follow-up question. Do you have a theory as to why, as a society, we appear to be, generally speaking, so scientifically illiterate? There's a, a number of factors that have shown their face in the last few years, among them a general culture of mistrust, mistrust of authority, of government, of media, of the elite, of which we are members, apparently. And there's also social media that has potentiated and accelerated these fringe beliefs into the mainstream. And of course, disinformation agents who have taken advantage of those trends to prize apart that those divisions even further. So those are three of the major factors, but they're not the entirety of all the factors. I think uh, as a society, we've we've taken our eye off the ball of what it means to strengthen the resilience of a common citizen. And we do so by empowering them with critical thinking skills. Susie Hota, I guess the, the, the more optimistic, positive interpretation of the time in which we're living is that it could open the door to all of us being more scientifically literate. On your best days, I'm sure you hope for that. What are your realistic expectations about this? I really do think that this is going to help us in the end. Um, you know, I, I guess I do a lot of education around infection prevention and control on a daily basis within the hospital. And even then, with a bunch of people who are uh, in healthcare, I have to repeat messages over and over again for people to really get it um, and let it sink in sometimes. So, you know, I, I think that this is all part of the process. And I'm hoping that after going through this for such a long time, the public picks up some of these things and recognizes the importance of staying informed on the science behind, you know, what we do. And, uh, and maybe it will even shift the way that we educate people, you know, in our educational curriculum. So I, I think a lot of positive things will come out of this pandemic when it comes to understanding science. You know, actually, I'll make the comparison to politics again, because they, they tell cabinet ministers when they're media training them, only when you have repeated a message 500 times and you are so sick to death of hearing your own voice saying it yet again, that is the moment where it's only beginning to penetrate the consciousness of most of your audience. Have you found yourself in similar circumstances during this? Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I feel, I feel optimistic about the science, scientific literacy question because there has been such a huge appetite for this. And, you know, it's really challenged me to try and figure out how to explain these complex concepts in a way that is relatable. And I certainly have, have been learning a lot, but but it it actually brings me a sense of, of optimism because, you know, people are really interested in this and they're really interested in learning. 
And, you know, sometimes it can feel frustrating to have to explain something over and over and over again. But again, you know, I think that good for us as science communicators to try and understand, you know, how do we get these concepts across? But also, you know, I, I remember in 2011 going to watch the movie Contagion with some of my epidemiologist friends and laughing because there's a scene where there, Kate Winslet's the epidemiologist and she's explaining the, the concept of a basic reproduction number. And we laughed because we were like, there would never, in a pandemic, like people wouldn't be interested in learning these like sort of obscure scientific concepts. And, you know, here we are in 2021 and people are, you know, really into understanding the data. We talk about the reproduction number. You know, I talk about that with my dad. Like it's it's become sort of day to day language, which I think is really, really great. And I hope that we can use this momentum to make sure that we, we improve science literacy going forward. How did you like the fact the epidemiologist played by Kate Winslet was one of the heroes of a movie instead of maybe portrayed the opposite way? <laughs> I, I think that was awesome, and I hope that that's what comes out as, at the end of this pandemic as well. Um, let's get into some exploration here about pandemic planning and plan pandemic response is something that has been, well, certainly in the province of Ontario, uh, a fairly academic discussion on this level. I mean, yes, we had SARS, yes, we had H1N1, yes, we had West Nile, but, but nothing like this before. So I'd like to get a better understanding. Susie Hoda, why don't you start us off on this, of, of all of what you have believed and taught and understood up until, I guess, a year ago this time versus the reality of what it's actually been. How different? I think a lot of the principles are there. Um, but when you look at most pandemic plans, they have maybe a part of a chapter that's dedicated to wellness and resiliency and, and supporting people through a pandemic. And maybe part of a chapter that's on risk communication and, you know, the importance of communicating. I think if you were to rewrite these, we're going to have to have at least half of our pandemic plans dedicated to these really important um, aspects of managing a pandemic. Because I think we all underestimated just what the impacts are of going through such a long, drawn out process. Um, and with all the different ups and downs and stages of it and how that actually takes its toll on everybody going through it. Ray Watt, how about you? Academic expectation versus the real thing? I think there are two big flaws of the pandemic plans. First is that they expected rational behavior on all the actors, and we've not <laughs> seen rational behavior across the board. And second is in the communications aspect of it, no one anticipated the burden and the barriers to proper communications, like having to explain to people and convince them that a real thing is a real thing, and like having to battle active disinformation agents actively trying to slow your pandemic response. Nobody anticipated that because we didn't anticipate social media or the political divisions of the day. And so I think there's going to be some frantic rewriting of pandemic planning in the next few months. Ashley, how about you on that? Uh, I, I mean, for me, I think one of the biggest gaps is, you know, understanding human behavior. And, you know, I'm in sort of those ups and downs in terms of how people are willing to go along with, you know, the things that we're asking of them. And similarly, you know, the length of this, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine that this has only been a year, it feels like a lifetime. And so I think a lot of those plans are really focused on that, you know, early days, you know, what do you do? How do you get systems up and running? But you know, questions around schools, and you know, how do we operate a school in the midst of a pandemic? I don't think those sorts of questions were really addressed to the degree that we would have liked. And you know, we're learning that now. Susie, one of the things that we have learned and that has emerged over the course of the last week, week and a half or so, is that there have been many, uh, not just one, we all know the most high profile case, but there have been many politicians uh, across this country who have said one thing, urged us to do one thing, and then done another. And I wonder from your point of view, how much more difficult does that make your job in getting the message across when political leaders don't reflect the values that you're preaching? I think it's really important to actually highlight these things because role modeling is incredibly uh, powerful when you're trying to manage a pandemic. And, and we just talked about behavior change and how, you know, we had underestimated the effects of human behavior on, on how a pandemic would roll out. A lot of that's determined by what people are seeing and the role modeling that's happening out there. So I do think that, you know, it has made things a little bit harder. It can undermine public health messaging when you see these kinds of instances. Um, and we're just going to have to continue to remind people that everybody's actions count. Ashley, can I get you on that as well? 
Yeah. I mean, if we have leaders who are supposed to be, you know, heading this pandemic response, who are not listening to their own messaging, you know, talking about issues with communication, I mean, that's the ultimate, you know, we can't have people saying one thing and doing another. And, you know, I'm amongst the people who feel incredibly frustrated, like now is not the time to be telling people to make sacrifices and then, you know, jetting off for a vacation. It's, it's frustrating. And it's, it's, it's sort of, I think that the height of poor communication and poor leadership. Ray, watch your view on that. We're in the midst of a crisis of trust. This is the crux of much of our civic issues right now, to be honest. And you can't, you can't combat a pandemic, a public health emergency, um, without both political will and public buy-in. And public buy-in is only possible if the leaders show that they're trustworthy. That lack of trust bleeds down to the scientists and to the media as well. So it pollutes everything that we're trying to do. We can move mountains if you have uh, public trust, but we don't have it anymore. Let me raise another issue with the three of you, which is w when you live this as much as you do, I mean, everybody's living it but not everybody's living it professionally as you do. How do you get away from it? Susie Hoda, can you ever get away from this when you just need to clear your head and get away? Um, small breaks, that's really what I do. I try to pepper my day with small breaks, whether it's actually making the decision to not bring my lunch so that I can you know, purchase a lunch and take a break from my email. Um, all of that's really important and making sure that there's balance in life, exercising, uh, spending a little bit of time uh, focusing on what's important to keep you going. Ray, what? How do you do it? Well, you try to watch things like good science fiction TV, but then you, ca you catch yourself like, mm -hmm. oh my God, they're not wearing masks. They're standing too close together. <laughs> it's hard to pull yourself out of that reality. <laughs> and I live with a family doctor who's my spouse, and so this is all we talk about as well. Uh, it's okay, though. I mean, this is what we're supposed to do, I feel. So I have to immerse myself in it in order to be thinking about it all the time and to be uh, uh, reflexive and responsive intellectually. Well, since you've talked about your spouse, Ashley, who are you married to? Yeah, no, I'm married to another epidemiologist, so we are sort of all COVID all the time. Right. <laughs> so how do you get away from it, if you ever do? Um, I mean, it's, it's, as Susie said, you know, small breaks, you know, turning off the internet every once in a while and just sort of forcing yourself to read a book or watch TV or you know, get outside, which is, you know, challenging, but it ha I think it's, it's really important. Good. Well, in our last few minutes here, I guess I should put the three of you to work doing what you do best, which is telling us uh, how we're doing right now. So uh, let's do a minute, minute and a half to each of you. Susie Hoda, how's the province of Ontario doing right now? Oh, I usually like to end interviews on a positive note, but unfortunately, it's not so positive. <laughs> uh, we're not in a good place. The numbers are going up of cases every day. It seems like, uh, you know, we're at the point of the healthcare system, uh, you know, being potentially overwhelmed. This, As of this morning, we had 374 patients with COVID-related illness in ICUs in Ontario. We're at a really, really difficult point of this pandemic right now. And the one, I guess, silver lining is we're in the process of rolling out vaccine to individuals uh, who, who are uh, high priority. So I'm looking forward to that um, taking its effect, hopefully in upcoming months. Ashley, what have you got to share with us about how we're doing? <laughs> I don't have anything sort of more positive to say. I think, you know, this attempt to strike a balance between protecting our health and keeping our economy thriving has failed. You know, we're not successful at either right now. You know, at a certain point, we need to stop with the magical thinking and actually, you know, commit to getting transmission under control. And then we can talk about, you know, how, how our economy will recover. Do we need a curfew to do that? Honestly, at this point, I think we, we need to pull out all the stops. And if a curfew would help, I would I would support that. Hmm. So if the Premier of Ontario were to bring in a curfew, he wouldn't get any criticism from you? No, not right now. Okay. Ray Watt, how about you? How are we doing? Well, look at all the numbers, right? So the test positivity rate, I think, is over 5% right now. Hospitalizations are up. ICU usage is up. Ventilator usage is up. We have a morgue in London that is over capacity, an over capacity morgue. We have field hospitals opening in Burlington specifically for COVID. We have the wastewater analyses in places like Ottawa, where I live, showing increased transmission. We have a new variant coming from the UK that may find purchase in our community. Things do not look good. And these are not the signs of a society that has responded to a pandemic well. 
However, as noted, we do have the vaccine. And it's in our power to pull out all the stops, to slow transmission, but also to accelerate the vaccine distribution. Those are our best bets to come out of this, out of this as safely and as quickly as possible. How do we accelerate the vaccine distribution? You get more, number one. <laughs> number two, you strategically deploy it. So you can get herd effects without having to reach herd immunity if it's given to the right people. And right now, it's a little mystifying to me uh, what the rate-limiting steps are to proper vaccine distribution. It seems that we're going to centralize centers like hospitals and relying upon them to distribute it, whereas we have existing vaccine distribution programs like public health units that know how to do this well. So I don't think we're fully leveraging our assets and our expertise as much as we could. Susie Hoda, last word to you. If we want to break community spread, community transition, uh, transmission, rather, which is the biggest problem right now. Uh, some people are saying give it to the kids because they're the worst spreaders, as opposed to the people who live in seniors' residences and so on. What's your view on that? Well, these vaccines have not been studied in pediatric populations. So I don't think that's uh, the right thing for us to be doing right now. I think, you know, it comes down to the same messages we've been saying from the start. Everyone has to do their part in terms of masking, distancing, not having uh, contacts right now as much as possible. Uh, and we let vaccine roll out through the population. Um, it, it's going to take all of that to stop this now. E-P-I-D-E-M-I-O-L-O-G-I-S-T. Epidemiologist. I can spell it. I know what it is. Thanks in part to you three. We thank Raywat Dianandan, Susie Hoda, and Ashley Chute for coming on to TVO tonight, as they so often have appeared in the media and helping us out with this. You be safe, you three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.